Hi everyone, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks. And while it might have taken me uh, six years to continue the series, I'm bringing back Tank Banter today, as I'm going to be giving you the definitive guide to crew skills in World of Tanks. Crew skills, without a doubt, are the most important thing to select on your vehicles. In my opinion, they're more important than equipment and more important than field modifications. And also, when you have good knowledge of equipment and field mods and crew skills, you can kind of bring them together to build your vehicle in ways that will allow you to completely dominate the battlefield. Now, I've delayed making this video because a year and a half ago, Wargaming were advertising Crew 2.0. However, considering we haven't heard anything about that since, I think it's safe to make this video today. And also, recently, Wargaming changed Sixth Sense so that it's available for free on every single crew member in the game. And so, I feel like it's worth investing the time to share my upgrade strategy and all of the different crew skills I pick for all of my different tanks. Now I'm going to have um, timestamps in this video so if you want to skip ahead or maybe rewind to be able to figure out all of the different parts then use them down below. So firstly let's talk about primary skill in World of Tanks which can also be called training level. When you recruit a crew you have a choice of either starting at 50%, 75% or 100%. However 100% is not the maximum that you're commander can go up to. You can actually amplify that in several ways. Firstly, you could use three different flavors of vents on a vehicle. Regular vents, bounty vents, and bond vents, which will increase up to eight and a half percent. Secondly, you can also use directives on a tank vent purge which has to be used in conjunction with a venting system to add two and a half percent onto that primary qualification. Thirdly there's a premium consumable that you will have access to which does cost a substantial amount of credits for each battle as a one-off which will add 10 percent additional crew skill and then there's actually a crew skill which improves your crew skill called Brothers in Arms which you have to have on all of your crew which will increase it by 5%. If you have every single one of these things, your commander can get to a final value of 126%. Now if that was not confusing enough, not a lot of people realize that the commander also provides 10% of their final value to all of the other crew members and it rounds up or it rounds down to the nearest 10%. So accordingly, because my commander has reached 126%, that means that all of the other crews, in this case the gunner, the driver and the loader, will gain an additional 13% as 126 rounds up to 130, which then gets divided by 10 to make 13, meaning that my gunner actually gets to 139% crew skill. Now a lot of you might be questioning, what does that number actually mean? Well, you effectively divide it by two and that's the kind of impact that it has on the vehicle. So, having a gunner that can get 139% base skill level rather than say 110% will actually mean that your vehicle is firing 14.5% faster. As well as also being able to see substantially further as well. Just take a look at how all of the individual parameter modifiers actually increase the view range of this vehicle. Directive 5 meters, chocolate 20 meters, the venting system 16 meters. This is where a lot of people don't realize how important vents can be in improving your vehicle holistically. So when you want to train up a new crew on a vehicle, Wargaming give you three options. You can either get the crew member for free, it will start at 50% of its major qualification, you can either spend 20,000 credits and get it at 75% of its major qualification, or you can spend 200 gold, which sometimes is discounted to 100 and it will start at 100% of its major qualification. Now, these percentage numbers don't really mean anything. And so what I've done is I've actually worked out how much experience you need to get on the crew member to go from 50 to 100%, which is 95,000, from 75 to 100%, which is 72,000, and from 90 to 100%, which is 39,000. And so when you're trying to make your decision about how much to spend when you're recruiting a new crew member, I personally feel that the sweet spot is probably going to be the credits, because playing with a 50% crew will be 
ridiculously painful. Your crew is literally going to be 25% worse, and no, I'm not making a mistake when I say that, because remember, it's absolute value divided by two for the impact that it has on your actual statistics than a 100% crew member. Keep in mind that also when you retrain a crew for another tank, that you can spend credits to retrain that crew immediately to 90% skill level rather than 100. And then you're going to have to grind 39,000 experience to be able to get them back up to 100. Now, one of my big tips for doing this quickly and effectively is to try, if you have one, put them in some kind of premium vehicle, possibly activate one of Wargaming's reserves to increase your crew training and play a few games. And it can save yourself tons of gold to do so and it requires a little extra work and you're probably going to make some credits along the way anyway. So now that you know everything there is to know about primary qualifications, let's talk about crew skills that you can add on once you've reached 100%. So when you train skills on a vehicle, it will start at zero and then slowly but surely it will work its way up towards 100%. Once you've reached 100%, then you're going to be able to take the next crew skill on the vehicle and then it's twice as hard to be able to reach the next skill and then slowly but surely you can collect them on all of your vehicles. However, exactly how much experience do you need to go through each of these skill levels? Well, it takes 210,000 experience to be able to go from zero to one. It takes 420 to go from one to two. 840,000 to go from 2 to 3, and 1.68 million to go from 3 to 4, showing you that it gets twice as hard for each level, meaning that to go from a crew level a skill 3 to 4, it's actually more than it took for you to be able to go from 0 to 3, which is why it progressively gets harder and harder and harder to get a more and more skilled crew, and why you should really prioritize the most important skills first. Don't worry, I've got you covered in this guide as well. To make matters even more confusing, some commanders in the game, like Quickie Baby here, actually comes with what is called a zero skill. So what a zero skill is, is clearly denoted here, and Wargaming finally have some information about zero skill perks. And that is that it doesn't actually add to the amount of experience that your subsequent skills do, and so it can vastly reduce the amount of training that it will require to reach the higher numbers of crew skills. Just to put that into perspective, most zero skills are brothers in arms for free, and if you have brothers in arms for free, that means that you'll be able to start training repairs, for example, from zero to one for only 210,000. However, a regular crew, to be able to get 100% repairs and brothers in arms, will actually have to train uh, over 600,000, which is actually triple the training requirement. One of the really hard things to accept for some tankers is to realize that their original crews that don't have zero skills will actually sometimes, even though they're close to reaching the next skill, actually take longer than if you just got a brand new crew member with zero skill and started training. Take this as an example. Let's imagine that you have just sweated through your commander and your commander has finished three entire crew skills. Well, that means that you've already grinded 1.4 million experience on that crew member. However, let's say you want to take it to the next level and you want to complete four entire skills on a tank. Well, that means that you're going to have to grind that commander for 1.68 million experience. However, let's imagine that you just managed to get a zero skill commander and they have no other skills on the tank. How long will it take that commander to be able to reach the equivalent of four skills? Well, it's going to be 210 plus 420 plus 840, that's 1.47 million. And because they had brothers in arms for free, that's going to be the equivalent of four skills. However, your commander, who has already grinded that amount of experience to be able to reach their three skills, will then have to grind the 1.68 million on top, meaning that a brand new fresh commander with a zero skill will actually reach the equivalent of four skills faster than a commander that you've already sweated with and have three entire skills. So sometimes it can actually be worth suffering and taking the hit now so that you eventually have a way more skilled 
crew eventually. Next, I want to highlight the difference between skills and perks in World of Tanks. Now, to be able to find out whether something is a skill or a perk, you can mouse over it and it says designated target, for example, is clearly a perk, whereas if you mouse over concealment, it says that it's a skill. Now, the big difference is that skills will scale from zero to 100% and give you a weighted impact depending on their training level. A perk, on the other hand, will not actually be functional at all until it reaches 100%. And so sound detection, which is a perk, there's no point of having it until it actually reaches 100%. And so accordingly, you'd be far better to start off training your crew with skills and then eventually resetting them and adding perks in their place. Next, I want to talk about moving crews between vehicles. You will have to retrain them if you want to use your crew in different tech tree tanks, and the retraining costs can be quite expensive. However, it is possible to actually use your crew in other vehicles without retraining them at all. Now, if you want to do this inside a tech tree tank, for example, Let's put my M48A5 pattern crew inside my M46 pattern. You'll see that a penalty is applied. Now that penalty is 25% if you use it in the correct type of tank, i.e. you move a medium crew into another medium tank. However, if I wanted to take Major Irene Miller and instead put them in a T95, for example, then you'll see that the penalty is very much more drastic and she is going to have a minus 50% modifier. Now, it should be mentioned that all of her crew skills will still work, so it kind of can be an advantage in other areas. But unless you're going to be doing this for maybe trying to rush through tier 1, 2, and 3 tanks of a, of a nation that you already have a crew for, I wouldn't really recommend it. Now to answer one of my most frequently asked questions of all time, and that is, how does QB use his crews in so many different tanks? Well, let's take American Mediums, for example. Let's put Major Irene Miller back inside the M48A5 pattern. However, while she can't go and sit in a tech tree tank without taking a penalty, she can go and sit in reward tanks or premium tanks. And you can see what are reward tanks or premium tanks by their color inside the garage. Here we can see that there's kind of a, a gold font with their name. And so accordingly, I could put Irene Miller inside my M60 and have absolutely no penalty. Then I could drop her down inside the Fury. And again, she's gonna have absolutely no penalty. Maybe I could also put her in my Astron Rex as well if I wanted. And so this is an opportunity for you if you have a lot of reward vehicles or premium tanks to use your tech tree crew in a variety of different vehicles without having a penalty. This allows you to compound your experience and training, and then eventually you might start to get really scary crew levels like this seven skill crew Irene Miller here, even though she's actually fought just under a thousand battles. And if you want to quickly move crew between vehicles, just simply click the tank, click the button in the top left, click the return crew to vehicle, and it will put the last crew that fought a battle inside it. So keep in mind that you're actually going to have to fight uh, a battle with the crew inside the tank before you're able to use this feature. I also want to make a passing mention to the fact that reward tanks and premium tanks have a special feature, which is that they earn more crew experience. I believe it's 50% extra. And so if you want to train up crews really quickly, then it's best to use your premium vehicles. Another passing mention should be made to the accelerated crew training feature inside World of Tanks. What accelerate crew training does is it diverts all of the experience from actually going onto the vehicle, which then you can spend on things like field modifications, or you can convert it off using gold to create free experience, to instead be invested in the crew member with the lowest amount of experience on a tank. And now you can actually see which crew member that is with this little golden notification here, which looks like an academy, which denotes which crew member has the lowest amount of experience overall on the vehicle that is then going to get the double. So this feature can actually be really useful on your premium tanks if you want to quickly train up a new crew member for another kind of vehicle, because of course they're gonna get double 
and a double and a double and a double and a double after that. However, once they've reached the same amount of experience as the rest of the crew members, this catch-up mechanic will get divided amongst all of the other crew members. It should also be mentioned that this accelerated crew training feature will effectively have massive differences between tanks like the Manticore, which only have two crew members, where effectively each of them get a double every other game, compared to larger crewed vehicles such as the German heavies, for example, which actually have six crew members. And so if you accelerate crew training on something like this, then each crew member is only going to get a double every six battles. And so certainly take that into account. So now I want to talk about how I reset my crew to be able to make the upgrade path as effectively as possible. As all of you will know, considering that there are perks in the system that don't work until 100%, you don't really want to waste uh, having a tank with a, a wasted slot until it actually gets to 100. So here is how I upgrade my crews and how I reset them. Firstly, I will give all of the crew the, the most effective skill depending on the tank type, which I will cover later in this video. Next, if I have enough crew books available that I know will push them over the 100% threshold, I'll reset them before they actually reach 100%. Now here is something very important. Do not use crew books before you reset your crew if you're not going to reset for gold, otherwise you're going to lose 10 or 20% of the crew book that you just spent. Accordingly, when a crew starts to get near the 100%, like 98% on the repairs here, I'm actually going to reset for free. Now a lot of you might be thinking, what, you're going to reset for free? But the reason for that is that I can, if they don't even have an entire skill, I can actually save myself 100,000 credits. And I feel like saving myself 100,000 credits eventually will allow me to buy more crew books than the experience loss is actually worth. And that is because remember, if your crew hasn't actually reached 100%, the difference between resetting for free and the difference between resetting for credits is going to be roughly about 20,000 experience. However, of course, if you have a huge amount of credits at your disposal, then just reset them for credits. But for goodness sake, don't do it for gold. You're literally just throwing away your money for no reason. After this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Brothers in Arms on all of the crew members, as this is a perk, but it's a unique perk that you actually have to have on all of your different crew for it to actually work and to increase your crew skills by 5%. So don't bother to take Brothers in Arms unless you know that every single one of your crew members is going to be able to get to 100%. Now that I've reset, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a crew book to be able to push them over that 100% level. And then hopefully it's only going to take three crew books. It does. Only takes three crew books to be able to get them over that 100% level from 98% reset for free. And then there you have it. We've got Brothers in Arms on all the crew. And then I can start assigning skills again and get them up in the most efficient manner. And of course, having brothers in arms on all of your crew members is the, is the best thing that you could possibly have. However, if you don't have any crew books available, what I would recommend that you do instead is wait until your crew reaches 41% of their second skill. This is the sweet spot that will allow you to reset for credits. And then if you reset for credits, you're still going to have enough to be able to pick Brothers in Arms and also still pick another skill. As a rule of thumb, my recommendations are that you should only reset the crew skill for free if they have less than one skill. I would recommend resetting for credits if they have one entire skill up until two entire skills trained. And then I would recommend you should only really reset your crews for gold once you've got to two or three skills. Because remember, you're starting to lose like a hundred thousand experience, which is a lot of time. Passing mention should be made to the fact that Wargaming actually have retraining orders in the game now. Now, the only way that you've been able to get these so far is by playing the frontline game mode. But if you can earn these in Wargaming's events, it actually allows you to retrain a crew without losing 
any penalty. And I would thoroughly recommend you save these for those three or four skill crews as it will actually allow you to save quite a lot of gold. And it's a really nice feature and I hope that Wargaming roll it out more and more. Now I want to give you one of my biggest tips and tricks as to how you can use crew members that come with premium tanks and not just waste them. You know, those kind of crew members that you get when you buy a premium vehicle or maybe you just participated in one of Wargaming's events and they're just sitting there cluttering up your garage. Well, one of my favorite things to do with them is to use them in new tech tree tanks. So, for example, let's say we want to put them in an Indian Panzer. Then when we actually go to the retraining feature, then you can actually start with a 90% crew instead of a 75% crew and it's cost you exactly the same amount. Or you can do it for free and you'll get an 80% crew instead of a 75% crew that would have actually cost you 20,000 credits. However, that's really not the best way to do it because you're of course going to have no skills available. The best way to do it in my opinion is to actually use a crew book on the crew before you move them. And then you can take advantage of a very sneaky mechanic that Wargaming has inside the game. And that is that when you retrain a crew member to the vehicle, it will actually end up taking the experience from their, their actual skills and put it into the primary skill. And so for example, I just moved that crew member from the Schwarzpanzer 58 into the Indian Panzer and we can see that not only do they have enough experience to be able to get brothers in arms and they've still got enough experience to be able to get 3% repairs but the crew member is immediately at 100%. Now of course this cost me 2 million credits but if you for example want to do it even more cheaply with crew books that you can get from the battle pass for example and you don't mind not having brothers in arms from the get-go then you will actually have enough experience from a 100,000 experience crew book to be able to train that commander to the vehicle for credits. It will warn you that the experience is going to go into the major qualification and you'll actually still have enough experience to have 73% repairs as well as also having 100% crew training. And that is so much nicer than having to train up a crew from 90 to 100 and then having to get crew skills as well. Nobody wants to play a heavy tank without repairs, nor a light tank without camo. So make sure you use all of my sneaky tactics that I've learned from my free-to-play account over the years to make things as painless as possible for yourself. Another passing mention should be made that if you want to move your crews in between vehicles and you want to change skills because the tank class is kind of changing, this can also be a very useful tool. If you reset the crew skill, for example on the T25-2 because I, I no longer want to have concealment, and if we take a look at what the next tank in the line is, it's the T28, which definitely wants to use repairs instead. But if I reset that crew skill before I then move the, the crew to the next tank in the line, that actually, again, that crew skill is going to go into the primary qualification, which will allow you to not only change from concealment to repairs, but you'll dump some of that repair training to skip having to play from 90% to 100%. And while I'd like to clarify, you're still losing, as I mentioned earlier, about 39,000 experience because that's how long it takes to go from 90 to 100. For a lot of people, that is a small price to pay to feel that you're going to reset the skills anyway and it'd be far better to train it into something that will make you much better from the get-go. So now that I've given you 10 years of condensed crew knowledge, now let's talk about the actual skills themselves. There are two brackets of skills in World of Tanks. There are common skills which can be assigned to every single type of crew member that you have and then there are specific roles that there are for a commander, a gunner, a driver, a radio operator, or a loader. Now it should be mentioned that not all vehicles are as simple as the Panther II here where there's one crew member for each designated role. If we look at something like a Manticore for example, you'll find that the commander is not just the commander, they're also the radio operator and they're also the gunner at the same time. Now you can always find out which roles your different crew members are doing by taking a look at the role icons in the top left hand corner of your screen or alternatively what you can always do is go onto the awesome tanks gg website 
and then it will tell you in the bottom right hand corner what different crew members are required and it will also show you which extra roles they have. So I now know that for the one to one for example the loader is also the radio operator. This can be very useful that if so if you're preparing for crews for tanks in the future that you'll know where you want to put the crew members that maybe have a zero skill. So for example, I know that the one to one is going to have high pressure on the loader, so maybe I want to put a fancy loader on that tank because I know that they're also going to need the radio skills as well. This can also be useful for planning for the future, for example, with the BZ-176, which the Chinese derpy heavies have not been released yet but we can clearly see that the commander is going to be the radio operator so that is going to be a high pressure role and so you probably want to have a premium crew member as a zero skill commander for your upcoming Chinese heavies. So let's talk about the different common skills in World of Tanks. Firstly, repairs. This is how quickly your vehicle will repair all of the damaged modules including importantly your tracks. Repairs is averaged amongst all of your different crew members and so it's important to have repairs not on just one crew member but all of them. I would recommend to have repairs on every single tank that you have tier 7 plus. Towards the low end it's not really so important because usually you can only get hit a few times before you're going to be taken out the battlefield but towards the high end when you've actually got some armor to start to play around with you really don't want to get locked down and you'll be an absolute noob in your high tier tanks if you can't repair your tracks in probably about 8 seconds or less. Repairs is mandatory on heavy tanks and also heavier tank destroyers and the only tank types that I wouldn't take repairs first on would probably be light tanks or self-propelled guns or maybe the most sneaky of tank destroyers. Concealment is your next go-to option. I would recommend this for all light tanks and even medium tanks up until about tier 6. Once you get to tier 6 and tier 7 it's arguable that medium tanks should use repairs instead as their first skill but light tanks want to take concealment first throughout their entire tech tree. Also, as I mentioned, your sneaky tank destroyers really do benefit from concealment and just like repairs, it is something that is averaged amongst all of your crew members. Concealment will improve your camouflage rating, which stops you from being spotted at larger distances. So, for example, uh, a tank with, I don't know, 50% concealment might get spotted by a really high-end vehicle at about 250 meters, whereas a tank with 0% is going to get spotted at the 445 meters spotting distance. So that is a huge difference, and it allows you to get closer to your opponents. It's the most important thing that you can have on your sneaky vehicles. It should be mentioned that concealment is practically useless on vehicles that are very large. So for example, the mouse. If you have concealment on a mouse, it's really just doing absolutely nothing. As we can see here, a fully trained concealment crew will only add 0.56 concealment to a mouse and you'd be absolutely mad to take that instead of something like repairs or firefighting or pretty much every single skill on this vehicle. Talking about firefighting, that's the other one of the common skills. And no, I'm not making a mistake, Brothers in Arms is a perk. We'll get on that in a second. Firefighting helps your crews to put out fire quicker. It should be mentioned that firefighting doesn't actually prevent or, or help in any way your crew from being set on fire in the first place, but a high level of firefighting can massively, probably even halve the amount of damage you will take from a subsequent fire. I would recommend firefighting as one of the later skills that you take probably on your heavies predominantly, as that class of tanks actually has hit points that are that are kind of worth protecting. Firefighting is practically useless for players who take fire extinguishers. However, for those of you out there that like to lose the fire extinguisher to use premium consumables, i.e. the food, this can be very useful indeed. But it's quite hard to fit on all of your crews until you've started to get like a four or a five or a six skill crew. Next, let's talk about Brothers in Arms. This is a perk and it's a unique perk because you have to have it on every single one of your crew members. Let me say that once again. Unless you have Brothers in Arms trained to 100% it on every single one of your crew members, you will get no benefit at all. You could have it trained to four crew members to 100% and then one crew member at 99% and you're going to get zero skill 
benefit from it. However, as soon as that one crew member that had 99% reaches 100, then your crew skills are just going to get 5% better overall. And that's literally improving everything about your tank by 2.5%. Accordingly, that makes Brothers in Arms probably the most powerful skill that you can have in the game, so much so that I've talked about my resetting strategy to be able to get it as quickly as you possibly can. It should be mentioned that Brothers in Arms also, as a flat skill increaser, will also help all of the other aspects of your tank. Take, take for example, our suspension repair time here on the Panther 88. Brothers in Arms actually reduces the time that it takes to repair the tracks by 0.13, which is a quarter as effective as a large repair kit. And that would make perfect sense because a large repair kit helps you repair your tracks 10% faster and as I mentioned, Brothers in Arms makes everything about your tank 2.5% better. So that is your quarter ratio there. Brothers in Arms, man, I, I really can't stress it enough. This is the skill that you want to strive to be able to get. And if you're not using it on your vehicles, you're literally just at a tremendous disadvantage. One of my favorite things about Brothers in Arms as well is that it increases your view range. And so that can actually end up with you not using to use, needing to use coated optics on certain vehicles, which frees up an equipment slot, which can be just game breakingly good. So now I want to talk about all of the commander skills in World of Tanks. Firstly, let's talk about Mentor. What Mentor does is it increases the skill that all of your other crew members will receive by 10%. Now that sounds good in the long run, right? That your crew maybe will get better, faster in the long term. But the problem is, is that the commander has so many awesome skills that you can assign to them that I really wouldn't recommend Mentor. Maybe, just maybe, if you have uh, like a six or a seven skill commander and you really don't care for things like Eagle Eye or Jack of Trades, then you could justify taking this. But I just look at pretty much all of the other skills as being more useful. Next, let's talk about sound detection. What sound detection does is it gives you an indicator of where the artillery shell is coming from. However, considering that if you're playing with good headphones that you can literally hear where the shell is coming from, this really provides you with little benefit. It should also be mentioned that this is a perk and it won't have any effect until 100%. Now, I would thoroughly recommend everyone out there who is deaf to take sound detection. And I really think that all deaf players of World of Tanks should be given sound detection for free as some kind of modification. But unless you are deaf, or alternatively, maybe you're playing on laptop speakers or you, you, you have, you're playing World of Tanks at work sneakily and you don't want anyone to know about it, uh, I would not recommend sound detection. I think pretty much every other crew skill is something that I would recommend taking instead. Next, let's talk about recon. What recon does is it increases your view range by 2%. This is mandatory for you to take on every single vehicle in the game. View range is key. It will allow you to be able to see your opponents at longer distances. What recon also does is it reduces the impact of when your observation device is destroyed. And when that happens, recon will actually increase your view range by 20% compared to if you didn't have it at all. But how often is your observation device really destroyed in World of Tanks and how much does that matter? Sure, it can be useful in very small uh, situations, but that's not why you take this. You take this for the 2% view range buff and it's one of the best skills in the game. Next, let's talk about Jack of All Trades. Jack of All Trades is a complicated one. What it allows the commander to do if one of the other crew members is knocked out is take over their position more effectively. So, for example, when your gunner gets knocked out or your loader gets knocked out, uh, your reload will be halved, roughly, or maybe about 25%. If you have Jack of All Trades trained, it will actually mean that your commander takes over that role with 50% better effectiveness. However, if more than one crew member dies, then it's going to be 25% effectiveness for each additional crew member. Jack of all trades can be very useful for tanks that want to drop a med kit because maybe they want to be greedy and use remove speed governors like on your, your Soviet tanks, for example. I personally take jack of all trades on my IS-7 and use it with a super heavy spol liner to forego the need for a med kit and use speed governors instead to be able to get extra engine power, but the repair kit's just too important to get rid of. This means that if any of my crew members die, that my commander still takes over that role, 
But you just got to kind of cross your fingers and hope that the commander doesn't die, because if he does, then Jack of All Trades is not working. It's it's an it's an advanced level skill, and 90% of players will never really have a need for this. However, there are those very small examples where if you want to min-max tank, that it can actually be kind of useful. Next, let's talk about Eagle Eye. Eagle Eye is a perk, doesn't work until 100%. And it will show you, after mousing over a tank for, I think it's about three seconds, what modules are damaged inside the vehicle. And so you can tell if your opponents have damaged fuel tanks. Whoa, keep it up, maybe you're going to be able to set them on fire. If they've got a damaged engine, well, use that to your advantage and outmaneuver them. Or if their Amarak is damaged, well, get in there and they're not going to be able to trade effectively. It should be mentioned that Eagle Eye only works for tanks that you are spotting yourself. And if you're aiming at vehicles that your friends are actually lighting up for you, then it's not going to work. Next, let's talk about gunner skills. And firstly, a very useful but also complicated one, designated target. Designated target is a perk that once you've managed to get it to 100%, if you keep your reticle within 10 degrees left or right of the target, either in arcade mode or sniper mode, it will continue to light up the target after they're no longer in your line of sight for an additional two seconds and your team will also be relayed this knowledge. This is amazing to take on every single vehicle that you can if you think that you're going to be actively spotting as those extra two seconds you might be able to see if that opponent may be stopped and turned left instead of right or is turning around to try and fake you out and coming back towards you. It can also allow your artillery to be able to have that extra two seconds to deliver that clean shot. It's an amazing perk for light tanks. You should definitely have this as a priority as one of the first skills you take, in my opinion, on a light or a medium vehicle. Next, let's talk about armorer. This will improve your gun if it's damaged. When it's trained to 100%, the accuracy penalty that you have from a damaged gun will be reduced by 20%. This is useful for if you have a really skilled gunner, but I wouldn't take it as a priority, apart from on certain vehicles that maybe raise their gun to avoid weak points getting shot, like the T95, or just tanks like the Griller, where your opponents are quite often shooting at your, your structure, and they hit the gun and go into the tank anyway. Apart from vehicles like that, I don't really see this as being that useful. Next, let's talk about Deadeye. This is a perk that increases the chance that you will damage internal modules or crews by a flat 3%. And that can actually be massive because quite often your chance to damage internal modules or crew is only about 10 or 20%. Think about engines, for example. So a flat 3% increase on a 10% chance is 30% extra chance for a fire. It should also be a mentioned that now that we're talking about crews that uh, have multiple gunners in some weird vehicles, that you only need to have this perk once. And if I forget, I will always mention if you need to have skills or perks on multiple crew members for them to average out from here on. Deadeye, it should be mentioned, is not useful on tanks that fire high explosive or Hesh ammunition. This is only useful for armor piercing, APCR and heat shells. This is great to have on all tanks, but especially those that fire very often at their opponents. I love to have this on my rapid fire tanks and this was how I actually managed to do my incinerator mission using a Cromwell Berlin. Next, let's talk about Snapshot. This will reduce the dispersion that your tank has on its turret traverse by 7.5%. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, well, what is turret traverse dispersion? Well, if you're new here and you haven't seen all of my tank reviews, you might not know that there's a hidden statistic uh, for dispersion factors that you will be able to access using websites like TanksGG, but there's no way to see what turret traverse dispersions are inside the game. The reason why I mention this is that there are some tanks in the game that actually have incredible dispersion values on their guns. For example, the EBR-105 only has a dispersion value of 0 0.05 when it's turning the turret. And so that kind of tank doesn't really need to have snapshot because its traverse speeds, or sorry, shall I say, its dispersion values when it turns its turret are already very, very good. However, tanks which have big old derpy guns, like for example the T124, actually have 
horrific dispersion values when they're turning the turret. 0.24 is horrendous. And so I would thoroughly recommend taking snapshot on something like a T110E4. And so accordingly, if in doubt, I think that all tanks that have 0.1 or maybe po definitely 0.2 dispersion values or higher when they're turning the turret should take snapshot as a priority, probably more so than designated target and dead eye. But however, vehicles that have really good dispersion values on their turret traverse probably want to be taking dead eye or designated target before there. Now let's talk about driver skills. Firstly, controlled impact. A vehicle that decreases the amount of damage that you receive and increases the amount of damage that you deal to your opponents if your vehicle is in the process of ramming. Controlled impact will actually enable a redonkulous plus 15% damage and 15% reduction when it's trained up to its maximum level. And it will also work with field mods and it will work with things like a spall liner as well. This is how you can turn certain tanks that maybe have a lot of weight but poor hull armor into ramming monsters. I love using uh, this on tanks like a 50B or an EBR or an E50M. And it's definitely one of the most fun skills in the game. But unless you're playing a tank where you would actively ram, I wouldn't really recommend taking controlled impact. Because remember, this vehicle, or should I say sorry, this skill is only effective when your vehicle is in motion. Don't think you can just take this and reduce the amount of damage that you receive from ramming unless you are the one doing the ramming. Next up, off-road driving. This is a skill that improves your ground resistances on soft terrain by 10% and by medium terrain by 2.5%. But it actually has zero effect when your tank is driving on hard terrain. So accordingly, this skill can be hit and miss depending on the tank. A lot of vehicles which already have excessive engine power don't really benefit that much for off-road driving and it will have no effect on a map like Himmelsdorf, for example. However, there are some tanks in the game, uh, such as the Gorilla, for example, that has an unbelievably bad terrain resistance on soft ground. If for some reason, it's 4.35 effective. And if you've ever taken a griller into a swampy area, you'll know that you just pretty much can't drive it. Accordingly, off-road driving would be darn useful on a griller, and it will revolutionize the speed that you're actually able to progress through swampy terrain or even perform on medium. Again, these are values which are hidden from you inside the game. So if you want to know how effective off-road driving will be on a certain tank, I thoroughly recommend you come onto Tanks GG. All in all, I really like off-road driving as a skill. It will be a priority that I take on vehicles because I love my mobility, but there are also quite a few competitive other options out there. One thing I'd like to mention is that off-road driving will actually provide you with 10% traverse speed effectively on soft terrain. And keep that in mind when we talk about clutch braking later about what will actually be more effective. Next up, smooth ride. This is a skill that reduces your movement dispersion but has no effect on your traverse dispersion, i.e. when you're just turning in circles, or alternatively when you're turning the turret. It will reduce your dispersion values by 4%, which is a lot, but it's uh, kind of half as effective as Snapshot as we talked about earlier. Again, different vehicles have different moving dispersion values, and so some tanks will massively benefit from uh, taking Smooth Ride, whereas other vehicles, like an EBR for example, aren't really going to benefit nearly as, as much. As a rule of thumb, you want to be taking smooth ride on your vehicles that you're constantly running and gunning on. But I personally find that apart from on certain tanks that have really poor dispersion values when they're moving, this skill can be a little bit overrated. Next up, let's talk about preventative maintenance. This will reduce the chance of your, you being set on fire from engine damage by a flat 25%. This can be very useful for tanks that you don't want to take a fire extinguisher on and tanks that have a higher chance to be set on fire from engine damage. If you want to take a look to see what your chance of your engine being set on fire from impact, you just need to right click uh, or you can even just mouse over the engine on your vehicle. We can see that a Panther II has a 20% chance to be set on fire from engine damage, whereas its bigger brother, the E50M for example, 
has a much lower value of 12%. And so this means that uh, a Panther 2, if you have the preventative maintenance, will actually have a 5% lower chance to be set on fire, whereas an E50M, it will be a 3% chance. Preventative maintenance is a perk. You're going to have to have it trained up to 100%. And whether it's worth taking or not, compared to all of the other awesome skills that you can get, it's a tough call. But there's no doubt that being set on fire less is very useful. And it, it can be a good one to take if you don't have access to firefighting or a fire extinguisher. Next, let's talk about clutch braking. This is a skill that improves only the traverse speed of your vehicle by 5% flat value. Now, clutch braking can be very useful on tanks that turn slowly. I love this on tanks without turrets because, you know, tanks without turrets, you've got to get that hull round quickly. It can also be very useful on mediums that feel more like drag cars as they're going around corners. However, I feel that clutch braking can actually be quite overrated in some scenarios for vehicles that have good turret traverses or have good, good traverse speeds already. And that is because when you think about it, off-road driving will actually improve the traverse speed of your hull on soft terrain by 10%. By so it'll be twice as effective as clutch braking, while also improving your acceleration and everything else. However, as I mentioned on medium terrain, it's only going to improve your traverse speeds by 2.5%, which is half as effective as clutch braking. And when it comes to hard terrain, well, that's going to have no effect and clutch braking will still improve your traverse speeds by 5%. Clutch braking can still be absolutely revolutionary. That 5% will propel you to godlike proportions in a tank like a Yank Panzer 100 or something like a, a tortoise that is constantly having to turn to try and get its gun on the target or just to keep the thick armor against your opponents. All right, next up, the radio operator. And there is, without a shadow of a doubt, one radio operator skill which outshines them all, and that is situational awareness. This increases your view range by a flat 3% amount, and it is mandatory to have on every single tank in the game. This is the most important skill, so much so that I might even take this instead of repairs on certain heavy tanks that have a very large amount of crew members. It should be mentioned that for very unusual tanks like the Japanese vehicles which have two radio operators, you only need to have situational awareness once and it's not an average. But you definitely want to get your hands on this one. Next up, Call for Vengeance. Call for Vengeance means that your tank will continue to transmit your opponent's positions that you can see for an additional two seconds after your demise. Obviously, this is going to be useful for scout tanks, but all in all, I would not recommend taking this on many of your vehicles. And in fact, I, I would think this is less useful than something like firefighting, even on a light tank. If you're out the battle anyway, one, two seconds, does that really matter all that much? Maybe in some exceptional circumstances, but probably not. Next up, let's talk about signal boosting. I have never taken this skill and I never will take this skill because apart from possibly at low tier games where your radio range is not enough to be able to call to your allies and when you're in like one corner of the map and they're in the other corner of the map, the radio system in World of Tanks is something that I probably think think that they had ideas for but it never really became important in World of Tanks. A complete waste of time. And relaying as well. This is for the, for the same reason. Pretty much useless. It boosts the radio range of your allies within your vehicle's radio coverage. But again, the whole radio system in World of Tanks is not really useful and this is a big old waste of time. And so all in all, that means that the, the radio operator is actually one of the lowest pressure positions. And I would thoroughly recommend that if a tank has a dedicated radio operator, you do not get a special Brothers in Arms crew member for the radio operator. And in fact, it might be better in the long run to actually kind of retrain any of your brothers in arms radio operators to other more important roles. So finally, let's talk about loader skills. So intuition. This has become one of the best skills in the game, bar none. It allows you to switch your shell types. You can switch from a regular round to a gold round or switch from a gold round to a high explosive round to be able to have that extra alpha damage against a weakly armored target or... Maybe you've just got a gold round loaded and you actually, that relatively lightly armored tank comes around the corner and you want to reload a regular round so you don't have to waste precious credits. 
I love this. Now there's one important thing to mention about intuition is it actually averages out amongst all of the loaders of your vehicle. And so if you're playing weird tanks like the AMX uh, 5100, for example, which actually has three different loaders on a single tank, then yeah, you can actually be incredibly pressured to take intuition on three different crew members. The Rheimatile Panzerwagen is another example of this, a tier 10 German light tank where not only the gunner is a loader, but also the commander is a loader as well. And that puts a lot of pressure on the commander. And so while intuition is amazing, it's kind of a luxury to have on certain tanks. Nevertheless, I love this skill because it actually allows you to do things in the game that other tanks are incapable of. And I think that this is one of the best skills on large derpy guns that have real big disparity between their high explosive rounds and their premium rounds. Think about the FV4005, for example. You could switch out from your armor piercing round and have from 1150 alpha damage that you thought you needed for that E100 who was going to come around the corner now to a Hesh round in a matter of seconds to be able to one-shot that Gorilla that just got spotted at the distance. Absolutely game-changing, and I thoroughly recommend you take Intuition. Should be mentioned that this is a skill as well, and so it's actually kind of worth taking even just a little bit of Intuition and scaling it up to 100, and then progressively that number will get lower and lower. I should also mention that Intuition scales very well with your crew skills on the tank. So, Brothers in Arms, uh, vents, uh, the vents directive, and also a premium consumable will further impact the effect of intuition, getting it down to a point where sometimes you can switch shells in just one second. Next, let's talk about adrenaline rush. Adrenaline rush will improve your vehicle's rate of fire by 10% if you have 10% or less of your hit points remaining. This can be amazing on your fast firing tanks with large amounts of hit points when you've been mortally wounded to give those last few rounds. You can turn something like a Badger into uh, a tank with over 5,000 DPM with this vehicle. The issue is, is that you're, you're, you usually don't have many hit points left when you've only got 10% of your hit points remaining. And so this thing is quite situational and I'd say Adrenaline Rush is actually the last of the loader skills that I would take. Now it's a perk, but it's a perk that you only have to have on one crew member. So if you're on tanks with multiple loaders, have one crew member that has Adrenaline Rush and then have the other crew member that has Safe Stowage because this is a perk that also works in the same way. You only need to have it on one of your loaders and it needs to be trained to 100%. Safe Stowage improves the durability of your ammo rack by a flat 12.5%. And this can mean that your ammo rack doesn't go pop, which is a pretty useful thing. It also means that your ammo rack might not actually get yellow damaged in the first place as far as I'm aware. This is mandatory to take on all of your vehicles in my opinion because it can free up your repair kit or it can prevent you from just exploding in the first place. And especially tanks which have the luxury of having two loaders, you can easily squeeze in at least one helping, which is all you need, of safe stowage to significantly improve your durability. So now that I've talked through every single crew skill in the game, I'm going to give you just some rough recommendations for all of the different classes in World of Tanks. Okay, so firstly, let's talk about light tanks. So when you start a light tank crew, the first thing that you want to do is take concealment. Then when you manage to get 100% concealment and all of your crew members, reset, take Brothers in Arms, and then take Concealment again. Next, focus on improving the view range of your light tanks with recon and situational awareness, and then you can start to take perks on your gunner, such as designated target and light tank depending, maybe if you do a little bit of shooting as well, possibly even Deadeye. Some light tanks that have horrible turret traverse will also like Snapshot, but all in all, you're, you're a light tank, you're meant to be a scout, right? So try and do everything that you can to improve your camo, improve your view range, and maybe even improve your mobility a little bit with off-road driving, or enhance your ability to keep firing on the move. Next up, medium tanks. Medium tanks are a little bit more complicated. Up until tier six or tier seven, I would thoroughly recommend to take concealment first. And then, unless you're playing the most sneaky, 
medium tanks such as the Object 416 for example or maybe even some of the Swedes, I would then recommend to take repairs first instead. It's the same as the light tanks. Once you get to 100%, reset, take Brothers in Arms on all of your crew members and then take concealment or repairs depending on what tier you're at and how sneaky you think your vehicle is. Then medium tanks, just like light tanks, want to improve their view range massively as well as also considering taking designated target if you feel like you're a bit of a spotter, but probably dead eye if you've got a good rate of fire and improving your firepower because that's what a lot of medium tanks are and they're quite dynamic shooters. So things like snapshot, things like smooth ride can be very useful. And depending on how good your premium rounds or your high explosive rounds are, getting intuition could also really help your flexibility to make better decisions on the battlefield. Apart from that, it's improving your durability. The medium tanks kind of need everything. Next up, heavy tanks. Every single heavy tank in the game wants to take repairs first, apart from some ultra low heavy tanks that maybe want to take other skills like improving your view range first instead, maybe at tier four, tier five. Once you've managed to get repairs to 100, reset, take brothers in arms, start taking repairs again, and then do things like improve your view range on your commander, improve your view range on your radio operator, on your gunner, you probably want to start even considering taking snapshot, possibly armorer as well if you feel like your gun's getting hit a lot. Don't really need designated target on many heavy tanks. I think you'd do better with things like Deadeye or possibly even starting to take firefighting if you find yourself getting toasted a lot. With regards to the loader, 100% would recommend safe stowage. And some heavy tanks want to take intuition as well that have those lovely meaty derpy guns like on the E100 to switch to gold. Now for tank destroyers. Tank destroyers, again, a bit like medium tanks. Most tank destroyers probably want to take concealment up until about tier seven or tier eight. And then some of them want to continue to take concealment. I'm looking at you lightly armored German tank destroyers. However, the heavily armored tank destroyers like the Jagdtiger uninstall the game if you're not taking repairs first, especially on most heavily armored TDs above tier eight. Then reset for brothers in arms, take it on all of your crew members, start retraining, focus on view range and on your gunner, probably want to focus on designated target and dead eye. Some tank destroyers don't actually have turrets and so snapshot isn't nearly as effective, but snapshot still does affect guns when they turn even if they don't have turrets, so it's still kind of useful. Driver skills, some tank destroyers probably want to take off road driving if they have poor mobility and it focuses on them, but quite a lot of tank destroyers don't have turrets and they can do very well with clutch braking instead. And then finally for your loaders, probably want to be taking safe stowage to avoid going pop. Adrenaline rush meh, can sometimes can be useful, but intuition is key in my opinion because a lot of TDs towards the high end have really, really good premium rounds that you can make great use of. And then finally, the most controversial class, the self-propelled guns. Self-propelled guns probably want to take concealment first all the way through. Why do you really need repairs? You've only got 500 hit points even at tier 10. If you're taking one shot, you're probably going to use your repair kit and the second shot is going to remove you from the game. I like to take then brothers in arms after I've got my concealment to 100, take things like view range, maybe even eagle eye. Artillery are possibly the only class in the game that I would recommend sound detection on if you're being lazy and you need that kind of... Uh, audio notification that you might be targeted and that you have to move, then that might be useful. Then it's about taking things that improve your firepower. Remember, Deadeye is not going to be useful unless you're firing AP, and AP is pretty useless in artillery right now. So take Snapshot, try and improve your, your traverse speed with clutch braking, maybe even take off-road driving to improve your, your overall mobility. And then on your loader, I'd definitely take Adrenaline Rush on an artillery, as well as Intuition to switch between shell types. And Safe Stowage is probably your last priority on an RT. And so, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is probably going to end up being one of my longest YouTube videos of all time. And uh, congratulations to you if you made it through because you now have 10 years of crew skill knowledge in World of Tanks. I really hope those timestamps were useful for you to be able to get through to the different parts of the video that you needed. And I'm sure that a lot of you are going to hopefully enjoy this over the subsequent years. Hopefully Wargaming don't announce Crew 2.0. Otherwise, I will feel very sad that I, I just wasted all of my time with this. But it was really nice to uh, get the Tank Better series off my chest 
and return to what I have always really intended for it to be these ultra in-depth guides for all of you new players out there but possibly all of you experienced players out there who never knew uh, what the actual crew skills did in World of Tanks. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did and you appreciate the extra time and effort and energy that I've gone to to make this, then make sure you give the video a thumbs up. I'd really appreciate it. However, if you thought it was terrible and I did a bad job, give it a thumbs down. And let me know in the comments if you think there's anything I've missed out or if there's anything that you thought was exceptional and that you learned from this video. And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.